So today I'm going to present the work we did called Size Prediction um, in an online profession e-commerce scenario. Uh, so to look at the task we are trying to solve, uh, so imagine that someone who is a customer who wants to buy the shoe, um, and then um, we suggest them, okay, based on their past purchases, this size, this size is most likely to fit them. Uh, okay, so how do we go about this? Of course, we want to solve it in a data-driven way, and what we do is that we have a lot of customer ordering purchase data. We have a customer, an article they, uh, they ordered, and then a size, or maybe a fit feedback about that article. And this is exactly what we want to do. So, uh, but before I get into uh, the technical details of the method, I want to show you uh, why it's difficult compared to, uh, if you consider traditional uh, brick and mortar retail in fashion, and I hope it will convince you that size uh, matters on the internet. So, uh, mass production. Um, um, so the, the problem with mass production is that um, a lot of times it happens that um, uh, there, there, there are constraints to the rich uh, articles uh, are produced uh, and maybe the same, uh, for instance, in a given size, and because of the equipment such as color material, they may be sourced from different countries. And uh, even sometimes uh, uh, production processes is dying, a material in one versus the other color can change and uh, size and fit characteristics. Again, even if you're trying on an article in a, in a store, you don't, uh, you know, that's not one issue, but uh, ordering online can. Uh, you, you don't have that kind of feedback immediately time you also and uh, also you can say it's not And then there is no standard convention of size, right? You may have small, medium, large, you may have uh, uh, multi-dimensional sizes for jeans and trousers, and then you have regional sizes where there are EU sizes versus American sizes. So, um, and then uh, by any sizing where brands specifically try to target a segment of the customers and then they can uh, modify some specifications. So it can be that uh, for brand A you uh, you buy it small, but then for brand B when you buy it for the first time you you may fit into XS or to a negative surprise uh, medium. Uh, and sparsity of course it's a it's a uh, also part of the general recommendation that it's extremely sparse the industry we have. Um, and this is again particular user, so it's, it's fairly common for some of the customers to, uh, uh, to have one account and there's maybe a whole household behind it. And, and how do you disambiguate who's behind uh, who's not shopping and how do you recognize it accordingly? Um, so all these things are what we consider when we try to suggest size. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, that's also uh, very often the case that you've been a customer and you buy shoes, now you're going to buy a shirt. Can we recommend you a size based on your shoe size or not? Um, so this is a uh, comparison if you think of standard recommendation versus size recommendation. Uh, what you see is the uh, image that was aimed at cost selling, whereas we want to uh, predict uh, fit the material that fits best. Uh, uh, recommendation of new assortment um, where you have small number of sizes. Uh, of course, customer cannot know all the sorting, but customer can be familiar with all the sizes that are out there. Um, sparse is free here. We have very sparse because, again, um, you may have bought uh, 10 different uh, articles, but only two of them might be shoes, and uh, now we want to ask based on the secrets of the recommendation size. Um, in both cases, there is noise, cost, and bias. Here you can make multiple suggestions, but here you I don't even want to predict the right size. And something which is good enough, uh, so how you know, you know, you want to be adding better than customers, or even when they think that this size is going to fit them, and you know, maybe there is something wrong with the article that they just believe you want to suggest them the size uh, that they, they don't think they fit, but actually good. Um, so what we do, we actually, uh, as I said, we want to uh, model this conditional distribution of uh, size or fit feedback between customer and article. We have uh, a huge number of uh, such interaction data. 
um, we simply define the log and likelihood and we, we optimize this with respect to these parameters, right? Um, assumptions that we make here that all the purchases are independent of each other. Of course, it's a simplifying assumption. It's not uh, entirely, uh, uh, it, it, it does have an influence on uh, what we can model with. Because you can imagine that the customer may have some sort of temporal um, dependency on what we order before and what we want to buy next, but uh, this will lead to uh, future improvements and uh, we are modeling uh, the feedbacks and have our variable and how that, um, and you sort of can imagine the mathematical paths of the sizes and the model distribution over the, the, the whole number of sizes that we said, because one size is more predictive uh, during the customer market. Yeah. And then, uh, so this is our tweet, right? And then, like, like another recommend, we just play this uh, distribution for a new customer added on the regular customer added there, and then we create the size. Uh, so, this is a categorical distribution, as I said. Um, and then, uh, this parameter essentially becomes as the output of the new network, uh, which has this architecture. So, you can see that uh, there are two pathways customer input, part of the input. And uh, each customer article can be represented by different sets of features. And then uh, they, uh, once we get the sort of data embedding the compatible, and then we uh, apply some more model carries to output the distribution over sizes uh, of the given article. Um, so this article, as I said, is, uh, is flexible in the sense that now you can have arbitrary set of features. Uh, those features that are categorical, for instance, uh, our customer's body type, uh, and peer origin could be, could be embedded and then you train and what embed is against them and to it and then continuous features such as their brain age, uh, their body measurements and more derivatives and need to be added to it. Uh, it has a really good sparse purchase because here uh, everything is trained and to it, so all these things are trained over these parameters, but here the customer market is really sparse. Yeah, it doesn't matter here because they can all share the information that comes from all the data. Um, so again, we can uh, model multiple customers and intents to it because uh, if a customer, uh, a customer ID that has come from the user's behind it, uh, buys, for instance, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a male person, a female behind it, then maybe based on the category of the articles that they buy, which tells the gender. Uh, can help us to disintegrate this. Uh, so it's not entirely that we can completely disintegrate multiple users to some extent. Uh, multiple coding categories, again, article uh, is one of the features of article, the coding category change, et cetera, and then we can do with multiple coding categories. Um, and then, as I said, we can return all the data we have uh, as much as we want. So, so, now I'm going to present some experiments. Uh, so the we had a last year at Brexit some a benchmark published uh, on size uh, and quick recommendation, and they had to benchmarks from online rental uh, platforms. And then here you can see that we have certain article features uh, in both in both the sets that we have some customer features, and those we estimate are the category of features that we embed. Uh, so uh, coming to the results. Um, so, in my defense to the previous talk, we do compare with the non uh, and we take the numbers uh, as it is from uh, the published paper from last year, and I hope they did their best to two parameters. We did our best to two our parameters, and we do achieve still of the results. Uh, the metric that they report, and across, uh, as well as accuracy and efficiency. We also compare with simple default computer network, and uh, and uh, which doesn't have this great input architecture, and we still have to find that in the group. Um, so now, uh, there is one thing that, um, very, that's very relevant for us in uh, this case is that what if you don't have a lot of information, uh, a lot of interaction from the person who is here? And what we can do is, uh, in that case, we can do important measurements. And, 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 and uh, so, for instance, in the interest of time. But uh, what we see here is that uh, in this case, in the data center, the customer interaction is very sparse. If we uh, don't include customer IDs, so uh, 
you know what we use meant, and this makes further assessments with your customer interaction is very sparse. However, article interaction which is less sparse, you can remove article and you can suffer in terms of your matrix. So it says that uh, even if uh, you have a lot of interaction, you can use body measurements uh, if you have, let's say, the real both side cases. Um, so now I'm going to go to work on live data, and you see we have a, a big um, set of uh, big data set with five years of purchases to uh, interactions for the natural and all the sizes. Um, we do back testing, so we train on past data, and we try to validate uh, data and then we create future. And again, uh, we see that we have, uh, here we compare the Bayesian method with people who test for correctness. In terms of uh, AUC and the top one to the accuracy and the likelihood of the output from the Bayesian approach, we have a baseline approach, which is simply a large number of populations. So if I have nothing, I can say if you come from a certain population, what's the average size in that population and I don't know that. So I'm used to the ABS and then we have a issue. We also do some uh, experimentation on category clusters, and we see that again on category clusters we are uh, much better compared to the baseline. Um, and again, across different metrics. Um, and also, we do something about uh, what can we do with the multiple users behind the account. So, in the first chapter, I have a uh, gender code starts that all the training, in all the training, we saw only, for instance, uh, one gender in terms of articles that the customer bought. And now, in test, test time, uh, maybe they, they, there's a, so for instance, if I saw a female, now I'm testing, there comes a male, and I want to recommend size, and, 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 and vice versa. And to our surprise, uh, we find that we are kind of uh, surprisingly better than the baseline, which would be what is the male average male size in this population, and we don't, uh, we have further investigated, but we think that the one is somehow higher or statistics uh, um, On the other cases, we also see a uh, high performance where uh, the gender stayed consistent, and then when the gender was missed, like there was there were no purchases, we were a little lower than the gender consistent cases, but still uh, not that low. So this gives us some good reason to believe that we can at least model uh, different genders from the account fairly fairly well. Um, so, I presented, uh, I hope you can see the little architecture that you can see next to it across multiple categories. Um, it has shown a little bit of concept in the message. Um, you can extend the architecture to model multiple objectives. Um, uh, uh, this is fairly straightforward, and maybe model time can be in the future. And, if you all have been to some other group that I would like to take another opportunity to see them there as well. Uh, you have the item and the user embeddings. 
after the two towers, you have a, a feed forward neural network that you feed both embeddings to, correct? Yes. Is there a reason you chose not to, at that point, also add in like features that are crossed between the two? Uh, as an example, how often that user interacted with that item, or how often that user interacted with the producer of the item? You know, like adding features at that point. Because the downside sometimes of using this footnet is you don't have features that relate to the relation between the item and the user. Uh, but if you have a neural network that sits on top of it, sometimes you're able to add those features. Did you try that and didn't work as well, or? So let me try to understand that. So you mean that if we didn't, uh, let me first go back to Yeah, so uh, is that, are you talking about this point or? Um, yeah, so where both towers join at the last point. Uh, so, you, but your question goes in like, why didn't we adhere to these features about interaction? Right at the, yeah, right at the point where we need. Uh, so, we didn't really, to be honest, see a need for that, uh, so we simply didn't try it because we thought that uh, whatever we in here contains enough information uh, because uh, essentially if you have uh, different customers coming in here uh, and they have similar preferences, overall uh, these embeddings, uh, so maybe uh, uh, these embeddings will be enough to capture all that you need. So even though to completely um, you know, different customers who end up with similar embeddings at the end would be able to help each other in a way uh, to, you know, transfer the purchases or the, the size of that information they have, right? Because we hope that two customers have similar bodies, their embeddings would tune to be the same in the end, and then they will help the information flow between, uh, you know, customers. And the same to a particles, essentially. So that's why they did not try, but that's simply, yeah. That makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Are there questions from the other floor room? So we will go to the third paper. Let's turn to the